Today, we are in the final week of Advent, right? It seems like time has just flown by, hasn't it? Like, it seems that all through this year, time has dragged on so much, but through Advent, it's just been moving at the speed of light. So I hope you've all got all your shopping done, and your food is prepped, and you're ready to celebrate Christmas. You're ready to celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus in whatever way that you can this year. So for our teaching series for this Advent, we have been looking at each of the four angelic encounters that are within the Christmas narrative. This common thread that each of the, sorry, the common thread that each of these encounters has um, is that in all four instances, the angels say, do not be afraid to the person or to the people that they're talking to, which is why I named this series, Don't Be Afraid. I know, really creative, isn't it? Well, I believe that most of us actually operate out of fear instead of faith in some area of our lives. For some, they may be like super focused on saving and hoarding all their money right? because they're afraid they're not going to have enough. Some might spend all the money they have and even some of the money they don't have on things, on accumulations, because they are afraid of missing out on something. Some people might overeat because they're afraid that they just can't live up to the expectations placed on them. And while others may undereat because they're afraid of gaining those five pounds and becoming less than ideal in their mind. Some people are afraid they're going to lose their job, and others may be afraid that they're going to be stuck at their job forever. Most of us have fear in our lives, and that fear drives our behavior. In my time as a pastor, if there's one fear that seems to be present in almost everyone I meet, especially Christians, it's actually the fear of being rejected. Rejected by a community, rejected by the opposite sex, rejected by an employer, or even, in some cases, rejected by your employees. Almost everyone is afraid of this rejection, and in some way that fear drives our behavior. It dictates how we dress and how we talk to people, what we eat and what we don't eat. It influences many of our decisions and it affects our relationships. It can lead us into sexual temptation and sin, into overworking, into allowing others to manipulate us and abuse us. And it can also lead us to be silent when we should be speaking up, to keeping our faith hidden when it's meant to be shared, and to faking our way through life so that we're accepted by other people. But church, I want to tell you that there is another way. There is a better way. We can exchange our fear for faith, just as the people in the Christmas narrative have done. Zechariah traded his fear for faith that God would send Israel a prophet. Mary traded her fear that God would fulfill his promise, her fear for faith that God would fulfill his promise and provide a king. And today, we're going to see that Joseph, Mary's husband, will trade his fear for faith that God has a plan. And that plan was to save us from our sins. So let's read from the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, Son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, 
He did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. Would you pray with me? To you, O Heavenly Father, we come humbled by your word, humbled in the story of Joseph and this angelic encounter with Gabriel. Would you teach us from this story? Would you help us to trust in you a little bit more? Would you help us to put our whole faith, our whole heart, our whole lives in your hands to, and just let you be our God instead of trying to run it all ourselves? You are good, and we love you, and we praise you. We're your servants, and we're here today, whether we're in person at our watch party in Stratford, or whether we are uh, at home watching online, we, your servants, say that we're here to listen for you. So, Lord, speak to us. These things we pray in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior, and all God's people said, amen and amen. So how okay are you with messy? I'm like so-so with it. Like I can be flexible and I can let some stuff go, uh, but I do appreciate when everything is kind of neat and organized and clean. When my kids were, were little, I was more frustrated at the kind of general untidiness of toys everywhere. Uh, but kind of slowly over time, I started to let go of the perfectly clean home as a standard, uh, and allow some, although not much, uh, mess in our lives. Now that said, give me a day to clean and organize, and I will feel a deep sense of purpose and accomplishment. When I read, read this passage, one of the things that jumps out at me is that God's plan is messy. You see, our passage describes Joseph as a good man. Matthew, the author, actually gives him the title of righteous. It was, a, it was a cultural title. And it meant that Joseph was a man who desired to obey God's law as much as possible. And then he made the appropriate sacrifices when he didn't. He was somebody who always did his best to do the right thing. And being like that brought Joseph into a moral dilemma. You see, Joseph and Mary were engaged to be married. Engagement in that culture meant that you were actually legally married, but you didn't live together for the first year of your life, and you didn't consummate your relationship for that year while the husband built a home for you. So then this is happening, and then one day Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant, and he knows it's not his. Talk about messy. And because he knows he's not the father, he's got a choice to make. He could, one, report her to the village elders. They would brand her an adulteress, and she would at best never be able to marry, uh, which would mean either poverty or prostitution. At worst, they could actually execute her under the Mosaic law by stoning her to death. Or two, he could simply divorce her quietly and then distance himself from her. You see, the thing is, both of these options would be, according to the Old Testament law, the righteous thing to do. But it's the second option, the one that Joseph chooses, which is also the merciful choice. You see, to be a truly righteous person means you not only emulate God in justice, but also in mercy. And I think that's a word to some of you. Like some of you feel very strongly about justice, about other people getting what's coming to them and getting what they deserve. And you've forgotten the mercy that God has shown you when he took all your sins upon himself and he forgave you. You see, that mercy that he showed you, he calls you to show it to others. Now, outside of major things like you know, killing people, cheating on your spouse, or embezzling money, for example, what you and I see as right and wrong might differ a little bit. Like, for example, some people, for them, drinking alcohol is very wrong. But for others, it's not. For some people, driving 10 kilometers over the speed limit is fine. But for some of you, 
and I've driven behind you, you see it as the unforgivable sin. But I would contend that there are actually more issues that are a matter of personal conscience than there are of universal right and wrong. But sometimes we Christians, we confuse the two of them. We make our choices, our personal preferences, into universal laws that apply to everybody. And that's how legalism creeps into the church. And it perverts the gospel into a bunch of rules that need to be followed instead of a living relationship to be pursued. You see, rules are easy. You know exactly where you stand with rules. But relationships are messy, including our relationship with God. And I think Joseph, I think he was a rule follower, which is why he was caught in such a tough place. You see, righteousness in the eyes of the religious law meant that he had to divorce Mary. Actually, marrying her wasn't an option according to the law. But then God steps in and through the angel in a dream tells him to do the unrighteous thing, to take Mary home as his wife. And in that moment, he has to decide whether to hold on to the religious traditions that he has always known or to obey God's call to him from a dream. And Joseph chooses relationship over rules. See, God called a righteous man to do an unrighteous thing so that Jesus would have a human father to help guide him. God's plan is messy. And sometimes I wonder if some of us have become so locked into how things are supposed to be, so locked into the the control of our lives and the cleanliness and all that, that we are actually afraid of the messiness of God's plan. Maybe God wants to disrupt the peace and quiet in your life and invite you to engage with something or maybe someone that's messy so that he could work in you and work through you, just like he worked through Joseph. Something else that Joseph's narrative teaches us is that God's plan is uncomfortable. You know, I think it's fair to say uh, that as a culture, we love our comfort. We love our comfy couches in front of our huge TVs that bring us comfort when life gets hard. We love our soft beds and our warm blankets that make us feel protected and good. We love our comfort food so much we created a whole class of cooking for it called comfort food. We love comfort. I love comfort. And sometimes I wonder if I and if we as Christians in Canada actually love it a little too much. If you've been around the church for a while or you've maybe read the Old Testament, you may have come across this verse in the book of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, he, the, uh, the, the author writes, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Now this is a verse that people love to give to students when they graduate high school or university. This is a verse that so many people have told me is their life verse. And and I'll be honest, I can understand why. On a first look, it's a verse that's hopeful, that reveals we have a reason to exist, a purpose, and that God is going to protect us and guide us into great things. I get why people love this verse. It makes us feel comfortable. But I wonder how many people know the context of this verse. You see, in about 587 B.C., the empire of Babylon invaded Judah and carried out a forced relocation of the citizens of Israel and took them back to Babylon, which is like modern-day Iraq. Jeremiah was a prophet of God who served kind of before and during this exile, which lasted for 70 years. Now, with that historical context in mind, let's read the passage again. But this time, let's actually back up to the beginning of the paragraph in verse 10 and then continue on all the way through to verse 14. This is what the Lord says. 
when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. See, everybody loves Jeremiah 29, 11, but very few people remember that the plans that God had for Israel included 70 years of exile in a foreign country from their homeland and did it so that the people would turn back to God. That's life uncomfortable. And one of the things that I have noticed in immature Christians is a tendency to associate feeling uncomfortable, a feeling like pain and difficulty and uncertainty with out being outside God's plan. They associate the two. And too many people assume that if life is hard, it means God isn't blessing you, that he's not for you. But it's not true. Jesus promised us that in this life, we will have difficulty. We will experience trials. And those trials are, in actuality, a gift from God. The trials that you go through are exactly what you need in order to know Jesus better. Now, George Mueller, he was a Christian evangelist and the director of the Ashley Down Orphanage in Bristol, England, during the 1800s. It's figured he helped care for over 10,000 orphans, and he established 117 schools that offered Christian education to over 120,000 people. In regards to trials and struggles that we go through, and he went through his share, he says this, God delights to increase the faith of his children. We ought, instead of wanting no trials before victory, no exercise for patience, to be willing to take them from God's hands as a means. I say, and say it deliberately, trials, obstacles, difficulties, and sometimes defeats are the very food of faith. We should take them out of his hands as evidences of his love and care for us in developing more and more that faith which he is seeking to strengthen in us. When we reframe our perception of our trials and our struggles and we start to see them as a gift from God, we can actually do what James, Jesus' brother, says that we're supposed to do in his letter in chapter 1, when he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You see, God had a plan for Joseph. And it wasn't a plan to keep Joseph in comfort and in safety, it was a plan to use him as an instrument to bring about the salvation of the world through Jesus. And that plan would entail struggle, trials, and difficulty. It was an uncomfortable plan. Joseph would have most likely lost the respect of his community and his family for taking Mary home as his wife. It may have been harder to find work and to provide for his family because his tattered reputation in a culture that was all about appearances. It would involve fleeing death in the middle of the night, moving a new young family to a foreign country and living there for a few years, only to return to the hometown that you left. Joseph was called by God to do something far bigger than his comfort allowed. Church, we grow through adversity, not ease. So does God have a plan for you? Yes. Is it a plan of ease, of wealth and health, of comfort? No. It's a plan to help you know Jesus as deeply as possible. 
And that means sometimes you're going to become uncomfortable. And that's okay. When I look at the whole Christmas narrative, I'm amazed at the sense of purpose in God's plan. To fulfill the prophecies in the Old Testament, Jesus had to be a Nazarene from Nazareth. But he was born in Bethlehem. So God actually had to have the Roman Caesar issue this census just for that to happen. For Jesus to fulfill the prophecies regarding his lineage with King David, God brought both Mary and Joseph together because they were both from David's descendants. They're both in his lineage. In order to fulfill what Isaiah prophesied about the Messiah being born as a, of a virgin, God made that happen by overshadowing Mary so that Jesus would be conceived. But so that there would be someone there to protect and to shape Jesus as a child, God called Joseph, a righteous man, to sacrifice his reputation and raise Jesus as his own. You see, everything God does is with purpose. In the Old Testament, it says in the book of Proverbs that the Lord made everything for his own purposes, even the wicked for the day of disaster, right? The Lord made everything for his own purposes. And in the New Testament, the Paul, the Paul, Paul the Apostle, I should say, says in the book of Romans that we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So God is doing this rearranging in order for your good. And I think a lot of us might actually be a little afraid of God's plan. We're afraid he's going to take us from our comfort, whether it be financial comfort or emotional comfort or physical comfort. But what we forget is that God's plan is purposeful. And his purpose was not to give us a comfortable life, but to save us from our sin. In Gabriel's announcement to Joseph, he says in Matthew chapter 1, But after, the angel after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Without God's intervention, we are lost in our sins. Our sins rule over us because they are embedded within us. They entrap us in lives that are substandard to what God's will is. And they separate us relationally from God himself. Because we couldn't save ourselves, and we still can't, despite all of our education, all of our technology, all of our progress, God needed to send a mediator to save us and restore relationship. Somebody who was perfectly holy and sinless, so that he would be an appropriate sacrifice. Somebody who was eternal, to be able to pay for the sins of all mankind for all time. Somebody who was fully human, so that the sacrifice would be for those that he identified with. Does that sound like anyone to you? Jesus, maybe? You see, God's plan wasn't thrown together at the last minute. It was prophesied hundreds of years before Christ was born. Even afterwards, the book of John, Revelation, John the Apostle describes Jesus as the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. And in our passage, Matthew quotes Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, in chapter 7. And that prophecy was given about 700 years before Jesus was born. Even though, and Jesus fulfills it. Right? Jesus is always God's plan to save us from our sins. God's plan had a purpose. And God's plan for you has a purpose as well. God's plan is for you first to repent of your sins and receive Christ as Savior. In Peter's first sermon in the book of Acts, he says that you should repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
You see, God's first plan for your life is that you would turn away from all that draws you away from him and that you would receive his forgiveness. You would receive his new life that he wants to impart to you. And if you want to make that decision today, wherever you are, to turn to Jesus and invite him into your life as your Lord and your Savior, then I want to encourage you to pray, just to talk to God. Tell him and confess and everything. Turn to him in prayer. And then, would you email us? Would you email me today? Here's my email address. It's on the screen. I'd love to hear from you and begin helping you walk in your journey. So the first thing God wants us to do, the first purposeful part of his plan is that we would come to faith in him. The second thing that his plan uh, that is purposeful is that he wants to use you to make disciples of Jesus, right? In the end of Matthew, the last things that Jesus says to disciples in that gospel, he says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God doesn't just call us to go to church. He calls us to be the church and to make disciples of Jesus of all nations. And I believe that God has uniquely placed you right where you are on purpose so that you, like Joseph, uh, so that like Joseph, God can use you to fulfill his purpose in someone else's life. You know, God's plan is messy. It's uncomfortable. But it's also purposeful. So even though there's a lot of things that we could fear these days, I encourage you to let them go, to stop letting them control your life, and trust in God's plan for you. Would you pray with me? God, your plan is, well, it's messy. Your plan with Jesus was messy. You, Mary became pregnant by the Holy Spirit while she was, before she was even married. Joseph had to give up a righteous reputation in order to marry her uh, and raise Jesus, who, uh, in order that you might be able to come and save us all. Your plan for my life has been messy. Right? It's involved moving many times. It's involved struggle and trial and difficulty. But you've been with me through it all. It's been uncomfortable sometimes. But you've walked with me in that discomfort and reminded me of your presence. But God, your plan has always been purposeful. And your plan for everybody watching this online for everybody that's listening, your plan for even me is that we would know you and we would know you deeper and that as your ambassadors, we would make disciples known. So Jesus, would you empower us to do so by the Holy Spirit? Would you help us to let go all of the things that we're afraid of, people's expectations of us, people's disappointments in us, um, afraid of you, afraid of all of the things in life. Would you help us to let all of those go and trade them for faith so that we could enjoy the life that you have called us to and invited us into and that we could know you deeper. You've got a great plan for our lives. They're not plans to give us ease and comfort. They're plans to help us know you. And so we say thank you for everything that helps us to know you better. And we worship you in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.